tina koto tina tato na mai hari mai kitine tunga na mihi kia koto na kai karero mai tinewa ko emi joseph toko ingwa he kai mahi aho no tipuna masaranga o aotearoa to legal deposit librarian aho tina koto tina koto tina tato katoa and that just greetings to all of you and to our speakers for the first and second session um, in this stream. I'm Amy Joseph. I'll be both the, the chair for the session and also the moderator for the panel. Um, and I'm at the National Library as the Legal Deposit Librarian. Um, is that a, an assigned mic runner at the back there? Excellent. Uh, so thanks to Tanya for stepping up to volunteer. But um, we've got Sean at the back of the room who will be our mic runner. Um, okay, so our first session is a uh, panel discussion, just kind of a, a bookend to the panel discussion that um, Jay and Hannah had yesterday with the digital creators. This is the digital collectors panel discussion. Um, after that, we will have um, a session from Sarah and Paul on the discovery wall at, uh, is it Turanga, I think is the name of the new Christchurch Library, excellent. Um, so I'll do a bit of an introduction to this panel and then pass it over to our panellists. So um, NDF is um, a very well established venue for inspiring conversations about digitising our existing collections, making them available and about providing rich and engaging uh, user experiences online and in, a, in our physical spaces through the use of digital technologies. Um, but I feel like we've talked a little bit less, at least in recent years, um, about building our born digital collections and what that's going to require, um, which is why I proposed this panel during the call for papers. Um, we'll certainly be picking up on some of the threads that have already been present in the conference this year, um, including, as I said, the panel that Jay and Hannah um, convened yesterday in conversation with creatives and creators. Um, also, Fiona and Masriki's presentation on acquiring online content to support the acquisition of a physical artwork at Te Papa. Um, and also some nice bookends on the main stage uh, yesterday with Michael Edson's entreaty that cultural institutions must find new ways to leverage their combined vitality and power and to involve communities and individuals more. And uh, Jess Moran's lightning talk starting to explore how we and uh, the National Library in particular might facilitate just that for born digital collecting. Um, my provocation to the panellists ahead of this session was to consider particularly how we respond to the ways in which contemporary born digital art, objects and documentary heritage blur boundaries. Um, boundaries, for example, between the digital and physical worlds, between the artists, the objects they're creating and the audience, between software and the artistic or informational content that that software conveys between the node and the network, and even between the traditional boundaries and mandates of our respective institutions. Um, so I'll very briefly introduce our panellists, and then they'll each give a lightning fast um, overview of what they see as the opportunities, as well as the challenges of born digital collecting. Um, then we'll do a very brief recap on some of the key themes to emerge from that creators panel yesterday, uh, before we move into questions. Um, we were going to have a creator on this panel, but unfortunately for various reasons that fell through. Um, if we happen to have any creatives in the room, you're very welcome to join in the conversation, and that's true for anyone in the room um, for that matter. We want this to be a broader conversation than just the four of us. Um, so if at any time you want to contribute, make yourself known to Sean, who is our mic runner, of course. Um, as you know by now, always make sure you've got the mic before asking your question or making your comment. Um, and But do feel free to do that at any time. And finally, just a small caveat that um, our speakers may sometimes be speaking from a personal perspective rather than as the official voice of their institution, uh, particularly in response to a question they you know, may not have the answer or authority to speak as the voice of the institution. So uh, bear that in mind. So our panelists are from your 
left to right, I believe. Jay Gattuso is a digital preservation analyst at the National Library of New Zealand. Fiona Moorhead is the collections information system manager at Te Papa. And Tom Ackroyd is the digital collection team leader at Ngao Tonga Sound and Vision Archive. So at least someone has a burning desire to go first, we can also go from left to right for our uh, intro um, sessions. Um, well, hello. Uh, thank you, Amy, for this opportunity to join this panel and this conversation. Um, my role at the National Library, I've been there for eight years, um, which feels like both a very long time and a very short time, um, has been as a digital preservation analyst. And in that role, um, I've worked very closely with the legal deposit collecting team as well as the, the Alexander Temple Library collecting teams um, and been involved in, in many projects that have um, crossed some of those boundaries and those divides that Amy was kind of describing. Um, so Born Digital specifically, I think is 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 a, a really exciting place to be. Um, I I think we've got um, heaps of opportunity to do great things, um, and I do often worry that we are not leveraging that opportunity as best we might. Um, I picked on um, three kind of key things, and I've got a whole page of notes which I will spare you. Um, I kind of drilled it down to the cloud as being one of our primary problems for me. Um, there's an as-a-service model, which means that we rarely own things anymore. Um, we don't own metal, we don't own machines, we lease somebody else's computers. Um, things are increasingly turning subscription, so we don't have access to content as is. We have it fed through a pipe, which is a sort of fragile, you know, we stop paying the monthly bills and the content disappears. Um, and for me, there's, 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 there's a real worry about, about missing out on serendipitous collecting, which I think forms a big part of historical collecting and, and how we've found physical archives over the years. I think that that's a real problem. Um, geography isn't real anymore. I mean, it is obviously still real, but in terms of where things reside and where things have been written, created, published to from, um, we, we're not bound by geography. And, and some of our legislation, policy, uh, and an internal kind of paradigms, I think, really still leverage a hard boundary concept, and, and I don't think that's real anymore. Um, and I mean, there's, there's mechanisms which are real, but I think we, we, should, we could be doing, doing different things there. Um, and then DRM is another problem as well. DRM is gonna bite us very, very, very hard if it's not biting us already, DRM, digital rights management. So content, you know, if we imagine being given a bunch of books or, 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 or um, papers, whatever, from a, um, a donor and they're all jumbled up and we've got a magical key that only one person can have and it's quite fragile, um, we would really struggle with that and that's kind of what we're asked to do with digital stuff quite often and that's only going to go and get worse with HTML5 and the inclusion of DRM and the HTML5 standard. Um, there's loads of legal stuff which I'm not going to touch um, and then technically, I mean I think primary for me is volume, you know, I think we've not reached um, saturation point we haven't reached capability saturation point, so we're still learning, capability is still growing, but the volume, diversity, complexity of this stuff is also exponentially growing. Um, and we're kind of, I don't think we're anywhere near seeing the top of the hill in terms of going, okay, now what does it look like? We're still learning, um, you know, sometimes on a daily basis. So I guess that's kind of my introduction. I'll probably park it there um, and hand over to Jill. Thank you. Kia ora koutou. Um, so my name's Fiona. Moorhead. I am the Collections Information System Manager here at Te Papa. So as well as looking after our Collections Information System and also Collections Online site um, in my spare time, um, I look after digital collections, both uh, born digital and transferred to digital. So uh, thinking about um, some of the challenges um, institutionally with this type of collecting, uh, two things came to mind and I think I'm going to be echoing a bit of what Jay said already. So the first is knowledge. Um, do we have the right skills and knowledge across the organisation? So this is not just the specialist skills for people who are working with digital heritage items day to day, but it's also the knowledge held by all staff. So how do we know that staff are seeking out the right types of digital materials to collect? And uh, how do we know that once they're in our care, these items are being offered adequate care that will ensure that they'll exist into the future? And is there sufficient knowledge about and support for digital collecting and digital preservation at the leadership level of our organisations? Um, the second point is resources. Um, so do we have sufficient resources and the right tools to be able to care for these types of collections? With digital becoming an increasingly intrinsic and vital part of people's lives today, 
we're in the middle of a big upswing in numbers and volume of digital items coming into our collections across all collection types. Are we ready for this? And do we have the right level of resources to be able to care for and manage these type of collections? Thanks. Kia ora everyone. Um, just thought that was the prompt to take a photo. And now I wonder who to, who to give it to. Um, my name's Tom, I'm a digital, born digital collector at Ngatonga Sound and Vision. Um, the challenges that I think, and opportunities, as you said, Amy, that we face are to do with the blurring of boundaries in my work, so that the traditional audio-visual or time-based media is now finding new homes integrated into multimedia works. Um, and that means the prospect, the exciting prospect actually, I think of collaboration across institutions, but also maybe the creation of new institutions. And I think that's something that I'm keen to, to um, see more discussion around. Um, a challenge is, as Jay Ampiano pointed out, a volume, sheer volume of material that's not only available, but actually coming into the collection, to our collection. And um, uh, not just the number of items that you might catalogue as a separate item, but also the digital size of these items. Um, as we go into much more high resolution imagery, especially in film and TV. Um, I got a couple of s suggestions from colleagues around not just the collection, but, but the impact that collection has on preservation. And in our organization, by preservation, we mean the migration, the, the, not the migration, the digital migration, but the conversion uh, from born digital files to something that's more normalized and that is archivally more, uh, has, has longer life and can be supported by, my next point, open source um, solutions where we may not be able to rely on third-party commercial organisations such as Apple or Avid or these uh, other software developers. Um, and so our, our emphasis these days is on working with open source uh, solutions to transcode audiovisual items into a, a format that will last longer. So it's, it's very attractive, but it's also complex to learn and, and operate off the shelf. Uh, because commercial software, of course, has a, a wrapper. It has a GUI. It's designed to be useful and to be easy to comprehend. Open source does not have that um, necessarily as part, of its, um, as part of its manifestation. I think that's it from me. Thanks, everyone. Um, so, as I said, uh, next up is trying to feed some of what we uh, shared and learnt in yesterday's Digital Creators uh, panel um, to feed into the digital collectors and making sure we're not um, operating in isolation. Um, so I wonder, um, Jay in particular, but anyone else who was at that session, um, what were the, the big takeaways from that for, for you and for what it means for our work? Um, okay, um, so uh, the, the, the session, the panel session, did, who was there yesterday? Show of hands, did people make it? Okay, so more people didn't make it, that's great. So we had um, three, three creatives. We had a, uh, an artist, uh, illustrator, we had a musician, and we had a, a researcher, writer. Uh, and we were asking them questions along, how do they expect their content to be um, um, regarded over time? What do they think reuse looks like of their stuff? And, and one of the questions I'm a bit obsessed with is, what do they wish they had access to that they don't of people that influence them? So, um, you know, in summary, I think my biggest takeaway um, was um, we, we have work to do. <laughs> um, I, I, it's, I'm going to struggle to distill it down to something salient. Um, you know, the, I, I think there's some, some shifting attitude in, in terms of what 
what ownership means of content. Um, there's something about revenue, there's something about being on the internet always, and that being where life happens, rather than it being a final resting place for content. Um, I think there's something about nuancing the collections and having fine-toothed comb, uh, fine -tooth comb tools and policies that allow us to deal with rights management, that allow us to deal with an artist wanting to use and using successfully pirated material to generate their content and it landing in our laps as being something we are then obliged to manage and look after going forward. How do we deal with the legacy of somebody else's perhaps less rigorous um, uh, uh, approach to copyright? Um, and then also things like anonymity, um, which, which the writer, researcher, um, Nikki talked about quite extensively. How do we protect sources safely and how do we encourage people to then deposit their content with us in, in, in a way that they're comfortable we're going to do justice to their secondary sources. So I was, that's probably enough on that. Thank you. Um, I would add to that from the notes that I took. Um, to me it was striking that two thirds of the panelists said that um, their work was born digital, stays dis digital, is self-distributed online. And I think it's maybe an obvious thing to say, but we are well and truly into the digital age now. Um, and we all know that for a lot of people there really isn't that much of an analogue record. Um, the contrast to that being that for uh, Nikki, the writer, um, analogue was increasingly important because of all those issues around privacy and security um, in the digital space. Um, and um, that, um, and this is similar to what Burgess was saying this morning, that we can kind of entreat people to be in control of their own content, but platforms give people an audience that they um, will find much more difficult to cultivate for themselves. So there really is an incentive for creators to be on those platforms and in those walled gardens, and that's just something that we have to deal with, I think. Um, so those would be the, the main two for me. I'm interested if there's anyone who was there who has anything that particularly struck them from that session. Um, I was particularly interested in the way they talked about their archiving techniques, their personal archiving techniques. I mean, my photographic collection is just insane and I have a librarian's mind of how I organise it but how they were doing it with hard drives less cloud was really interesting and how we're going to collect that and if we want to collect that and the internet archives as well so yeah um, Jay can you speak to um, the respective challenges of archiving from hard drives and from the cloud I, I, I can give it a whack um, so I think one of the things that two of them said was we don't delete anymore. Now we're digital, we don't delete. We just kind of shovel it off to the side and we get going. So so there was um, one one explicitly and one implicitly was suggesting they're not self um, they're not self curating their own archive as they as they kind of go through the creation process. The net result is, and we've 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 dealt with this a couple of times at the library. Um, you know, somebody somebody donates their collection and it's a hard drive and we kind of have to work with them to assert what order looks like and to make sure that we're collecting and ingesting the correct things. But I think increasingly that's a bit of a fool's errand. I think, you know, we can on the one hand just throw a big loop around it and shovel the whole thing in and go like, hey, Philly Boots, or we do something where we go, we'll have this file and that file and the rest is is junk and, and who knows what the answer is. Um, the cloud is an even bigger mess, you know. we. I, I like to, I often, you know, it's a bit of a horror story, but I think about mega uploads, where mega uploads got removed from the internet, um, whatever it was, seven years ago, 4% of the internet disappeared literally overnight. It was there, and then people woke up in the morning, and it was gone. And this is a bunch of stolen stuff, and also a bunch of, you know, proper things that people owned the IP for that they never got back again. So the cloud, it's got volume like hard drives, but it's also got intangibility, which I think we're going we're gonna to really um, suffer from. And so for me, I think um, tools, we don't have tools. We don't have any sense of tool building, what it means to have professional weapons grade tools that we can go and collect and harvest and manage um, collections of the scale that we're, that we're expecting to. Um, and without getting too far into, a, into kind of muddy waters, there are agencies who do this. And I think we heard this morning about agencies who are very competent at managing that level and scale of data. 
we're not even in the same country, let alone the same street, same house, same conversation. So for me, I think that we're, we're missing something. Okay. Um, one other quick takeaway for me was um, Jim, the comics artist, pointed out that um, one of the sort of outputs of work in that community is brushes that they create and share online. So people are also um, creating and sharing these tools as, as well as what we would consider more traditional outputs. Um, a question for Fiona. Um, can you speak to the state, perhaps, of um, the art scene in New Zealand and to what extent artists are producing uh, digital works or digitally kind of enhanced works um, and where Te Papa and other collecting galleries are seeing that going? Hmm. <laughs> So um, uh, my background prior to being here, I've spent around 10 years working in contemporary art galleries and collecting institutions, so that's where that question comes from. I think um, it's, it's an interesting one because I think that there are um, always trends in what art is being produced and also what art is being collected, and certainly there has been a huge upswing in the amount of um, digital video work um, or... Um, interactive type works that have been crea created and then collected by institutions. Um, I don't know that I'm necessarily the right person to talk about the, the, the scale and types of this, but I know um, in my work here at Te Papa there are certainly some challenging works that have been collected relatively early on in terms of um, New Zealand institutions collecting video art. So works from, say, the early 2000s um, where they need revisiting and need format migrations. They need work being done on them in order for them to survive into the future. And I think sometimes uh, video art particularly has been collected by institutions without necessarily a clear understanding of foresight of how that will be managed into the future. And it's something that um, has changed over time. And I know a lot of collecting institutions do do a form of questionnaire or interview process with the artist or creator to try and find out more about uh, what is the life cycle of this artwork? Will there be a time at which it needs to be migrated to a different form? Is that okay? Or is there a possibility that the work will cease to exist um, and will um, need to be deaccessioned or considered in a different way um, in the future? So I guess that's kind of an interesting idea. When we're thinking of collecting, we want to think about the perpetuity of collecting, but I think the digital space um, is a much more interesting space where a collection may have a lifespan, a more finite lifespan. Are you finding now that you're going back to um, artists that you acquired works from earlier when maybe these plans weren't so robustly in, in place and saying, OK, how, how do we um, extend the lifespan of this work at this point in time? Uh, yes, I think that most collecting institutions um, who are collecting artworks, that's a necessary p part of that work. and. I think um, the longer it goes between the point of collection and the point that you have to revisit it, sometimes the harder it gets. You know, what happens when an artist is no longer living and you're dealing with an estate? What happens if it's a collective and the collective are no longer working together? Um, yeah, the further down the track it goes, the more difficult it can be. And it's also a question of resources. Often with collecting institutions, you're looking um, at the point of acquisition. You're always looking at the new things. And sometimes it can be harder to backtrack um, in the things that have already been collected and try and solve some of the mysteries. Um, often from an art perspective, um, those things are dealt with when the artwork is being considered for an exhibition or loan and sometimes the time scale required for that can make it too hard to deal with so it becomes yet another thing that is known about but not um, not adequately dealt with and managed um, so that that artwork will continue into the future. Um, that probably makes a, a good time to insert a special guest question. Um, so we were going to have Nick Richardson, who works at ACME, on the panel um, when he was initially planning on being here for NDF. Um, unfortunately, he had to stay in Australia. Um, but um, I asked if he had any questions to put to the panel, um, and his question was... Um, 
So we know that with um, digital, um, quite often the need for intervention is earlier in the life cycle of a work. Um, but are we learning ways of managing those interventions and offering advice and working with um, creators in a way that um, has minimal impact on their actual, like the core of their artistic practice and, and the works they're trying to produce and, and how do we balance that tension? So anyone can take that one? I might give it a quick go and see if anyone else wants to comment. I think it's um, always interesting, um, particularly from an art context, you can learn from some of your interactions, but you can't assume that one size fits all and one approach is the only way of doing it. And I think um, earlier in my career, um, I found it really interesting. I remember asking a colleague, you know, why don't we just make a set of rules? And whenever we're receiving an artwork, like don't, you know, if it's a digital artwork, we will only accept these kind of formats and have it have this kind of um, information. Um, particularly with artists, if anyone here in the audience has worked with artists, that really doesn't work. <laughs> and I think it's uh, way more important to be um, more open and to have a good um, relationship and conversation with the producer rather than being an, a collecting institution that is all about the rules and expecting the artist or the maker of the collection item to conform to your sometimes from an artist's point of view, maybe arbitrary set of rules. I think the, the analog for that in <clears throat> in the film and TV world is is what do creators, what resources do creators have at their disposal throughout the creation of their work? And that talks to its dissemination, how popular it will be, whether it has the support of public funding, whether it has the support of large commercial entities like studios, and that those studios and or post-production facilities that are well established have very clear and uh, one would hope um, consistent and um, long-lasting procedures to look after that material. But if you, if you are a sole creator, and you are not aware even of the ex existence of archival institutions such as Ngautanga Sound and Vision. Um, the brand awareness of our organisation <coughs> is high in certain areas of the population and low in many others. There, those interventions, as you say, are met with kind of bewilderment. And, and I often think now that uh, it is what it is that what you are offered is, if you're not able to go back to a creator and say, actually, could we have this, this, and this, that um, you take what they have, and that is then defined as the object, if you like, it, 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 whatever state it's in. If it was a VHS, if it was a piece of film, if it was a, a low-res uh, Vimeo download, as opposed to a piece of negative or a uh, you know something more master like and so everything in between I can go back to certain depositors that we have relationships with and say you, you've offered this we would prefer that do you have access to that if if you don't I can talk to people who may and then that conversation goes on so I think having rules uh, you know is appropriate in some instances like say with broadcasters and um, medium to um, high level uh, film feature productions but yeah the 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 creator who works in small teams <coughs> especially maybe at the beginning of their careers unless they're never going to pick up the phone and go hey to an archive and say hey how do i do this they'll they'll talk to who taught them and their peers um i could probably talk to this topic for about seven hours. Um, I think it's I think it's crucial to the success of of, of longevity of information. Um, I'm trying to in my head decide which of the 17 strands that kind of got pinged as, as as our colleagues were talking that I wanted to talk to, and I'm going to talk particularly about a particular format. Um, 
So we're format agnostic. We never make any guidance, much to Amy's chagrin. We are often asked, can you tell us what format things should be? And we often refuse to do that um, because we specifically don't want to influence the creative process. Um, oftentimes, a creator doesn't care um, and they just want a piece of sensible guidance. And so I think sometimes good advice falls in that crack. Um, one of the projects, one of the collections I'm working on right now is um, is music compositions um, um, pieces. So um, they are of a particular software, which I'm not going to name for reasons that may become clear. Um, and um, they were originally written in 2001. The collection is great. It's a national collection of a, of a, of a national um, composer. Um, we can get contemporary versions of the software and we have a license for the su for as such, um, except from when we open it with the software, it says, hey, this was created in 2001. I've made a bunch of changes. Don't worry about it. It's probably cool. Um, everything all right? And that's it. And you kind of, I got into a conversation with them and I said, hey, like this probably is not okay for, for doing the work that we do. We, we probably care a bit more about what those, what those imaginary changes are. Um, they worked with me amazingly well for a very long time, um, for a number of weeks, which is a long time in, in keeping the attention of a, a software ticket. Um, and then eventually it got to their management layer and they decided they were not going to support us. They wouldn't sell me the software from 2001. They don't want to support it. They don't want to sell me a license. And so I can't actually legally buy the software from the vendor for the product that was created in 2001. That's not very long ago. So, you know, I think for me, we're, we're still unraveling the challenges of 20 years ago. Um, I would hate for us to be in 20 years time bickering about what do we do with Twitter and what do we do with Facebook? You know, I would imagine those companies are going to be long gone. I uh, suspect they might or might not. <laughs> I'm not making an opinion either way, and nor does my employer. Um, but, but I hope that in 20 years time, we're not still thinking about what it means to collect that stuff. I think we've learned enough, and I hope that the advice that we can give to to people who are willing to work with us is along the lines of using open source, of, of um, you know, managing, managing that stack, that the technology stack sanely, um, and really thinking about the distance of the object that you are collecting, but also, and, and, and counterintuitively, dealing with things like um, that the colleagues yesterday were talking about, which is they want to see process. So let's look over the shoulders of creators and not just take their, their, their scrapbooks. Let's take them making that process and think, and think um, you know, across those boundaries and, and you know, do, do different things, because I think at the moment we're missing some of that story. Thank you. Um, one of the, the, the boundaries that um, I mentioned in the preamble was the distinction between um, an object of interest as the node and the network that ex it exists within and possibly another node in that network is the the audience or the person who is consuming that content. Um, so um, I guess with that I'm trying to say that a lot of the time in various different um, fields of endeavour, um, the kind of works that people are producing may rely on input from the user or about inferring knowing something about the user from the data that is flooding around them to um, make a decision about what to present to them um, and also that it can be very hard to extract a bounded thing um, that lives on the internet from that context and put it away in a collection. Um, so I just wonder if you have any comment on how we deal with those nodes in this very, very intricate network that we've decided are of importance to continue to understand and access into the future. I'll I'll chuck a starter on the table, I, and and it's and it's a it's a, an oblique answer, I'm afraid. Sorry, Amy. Um, I think for me, one of the answers lies in organisational readiness, organisational um, digital literacy. I think if we're making collecting decisions, if we're making collection choices, we are obliged to understand the domain from which we're collecting, and if the voices which are informing, progressing, working on, you know, every stage don't have a, a really comfortable grounding in what they're dealing with, I think we've got a problem. So I, I think the challenge back would be think about your organization and think about those people who you have doing that collecting. Do we offshore the, the, the really careful professional um, information management that is digital collecting to the institutional um, ICT, who may be very good at understanding the enterprise level mechanisms, perhaps less well versed in what, what the, the archival practice or forensic-like practice we might want to adopt. So for me, I think organizational digital literacy is a real key to this. Knowing the domain we work within helps us to start to explore what, what the problems actually are and have um, professional conversations about what our challenges are. Um, I know, Fiona, yesterday one of the um, things that 
to Papa discuss when they were looking at capturing the Instagram account that went along with the artwork was, do we feel comfortable taking the interactions of other people with Instagram accounts who interacted with the Instagram account from the collective? Um, so maybe you could very quickly recap what decision you made there. Sure, so the artwork that um, Amy's describing is an artwork by Mata Aho Collective, uh, a collective of four women who made a large sculptural work um, made from many layers of sewn tarpaulin, um, which has been um, exhibited at Documenta in Kassel in Germany um, and is currently in the Oceania exhibition um, at the Royal Academy in London. Um, and so when the, this artwork was proposed for acquisition, um, both the sculptural element um, and also some digital elements were considered as part of the one acquisition. So the digital elements were a website containing narratives about Tanifa um, that sat alongside the artwork. But another element was uh, the Instagram account of the collective that documented the conceptualization and production of the sculptural artwork and also the process of the collective taking that artwork to the exhibition in Germany. Um, and so the so there was quite a long process and a lot of discussion about what would be collected and why it would be collected and um, the Instagram account um, displayed pictures created by the collective but also comments from their colleagues and friends and supporters um, and that was a, a challenge that we had to work through of if we wanted to collect this what would it mean to have all of these comments that people had made on Instagram who didn't necessarily think that it would end up within the national uh, collection <laughs> um, and so the resolution we came to with that after speaking with um, Victoria Leachman the rights manager here at Te Papa was to collect the, a recording of the Instagram account, but um, for it to be collected in a way where it could be used by researchers and also by staff members to understand more about the context of the creation of the artwork, but it wouldn't necessarily be displayed alongside the artwork. And so that um, um, in discussion with Victoria, we came to the conclusion that that was an acceptable um, example of this collecting of social media, that um, it wouldn't necessarily be um, plastered on the walls with people's comments, um, you know, out of, out of context um, and uh, people being very surprised that that was collected. Um, but I guess another example that comes to mind for me um, if you've been into um, Te Papa's exhibition spaces recently, you would see um, an artwork by Janet Lilo, um, which includes um, screen captures and also video footage um, by members of the public. So the screen captures are from a now defunct social media platform called Bebo. And, um, <laughs> and the, uh, the videos are people um, uh, like fan art, um, like creating versions of their favourite songs. And so that uh, is another recent acquisition uh, within Te Papa's art collection. And obviously that has some really big repercussions. What does it mean, um, as Amy said before, uh, what does it mean when you are an institution collecting something that has been created by somebody who doesn't necessarily abide by the same um, copyright concerns that we would if we were creating this item ourselves. Um, you know, what does it mean to collect something that contains another person's creative work that they didn't necessarily create as part of that artwork? And one of the resolutions that we've come to with that um, is that we uh, will be receiving the final version of that artwork in a form that we can um, essentially take down um, items from that artwork um, in conjunction with the artist. So for instance, if somebody comes to us who created one of those videos and they object to their video being part of Janet's artwork, um, it can be removed from the final cut of the artwork. But oh my goodness, it's like a, <laughs> it's, um, I think it's awesome how artists work to um, stretch boundaries and also sometimes to challenge us in this way and um, while it may cause some headaches for us um, managing these collections I think it's um, 
yeah, really refreshing. And I hope that artists and creators keep doing this because it's just an awesome um, uh, stretching of the boundaries, but also the creative process moving in new directions. I just no, that's really interesting, and I've thought of a kind of a, a, a version of that that before I mention it, th these things change over time. So the older something gets, the more or the, the less worried people are about peering into past lives. And I'm thinking of Patrick Pan's um, exhibition at the City Gallery recently, which is the photographs in that collection would extend back at least 100 years, some of them. And they're all presented without I was going to say without permission. These are, these are photographs that may have been private, that have slipped out into other collections. He's scoured eBay for years buying these things, putting them on display. It's a f it was a fantastic exhibition. And it was, uh, it, was a, it was a glimpse into people's past lives, but also the artist's conception of, of reflection and the construction of it. And, but I wonder whether, the, whether he uh, uh, and, and the City Gallery have had these same kinds of conversations. Perhaps not, because it's so old. It's, it's, it's moved beyond that. It's become part of the commons, I, I would argue. And I don't know whether that would happen again with, with current digital work. It is publicly available on the internet. Instagram, if, if, if you follow someone on Instagram and they haven't got a locked account, then dot, dot. Um, any questions or comments from the audience at this point? Okay, um, so I wanted to move into uh, some questions that are loosely um, based around some formats. They're not necessarily questions about formats, but I'm kind of going to frame the conversation around them. Um, I was trawling through some of the strategic uh, documents of our respective institutions in preparation for this panel. Um, and one of the sentences that jumped out at me from Na Tonga's str strategy um, is the statement, moving image and sound is the prime currency of modern culture. Um, and we've talked about uh, video art as well. So that's also an example of, of moving image, at least, and probably sound as well. Um, and if you think about something that would traditionally be collected by the National Library, what are the conference proceedings of this conference? The, the NDF YouTube channel. Um, there may be, people may choose to share papers and slides and other um, things online as well, um, but definitely the primary conference proceedings are the, the videos. Um, so that's, that's a case where most collecting institutions are interested in collecting um, sound and vision content for different reasons um, and having different mandates that kind of motivate that. Um, so I wonder if um, particularly now Tonga is thinking about how they collaborate and lead in that space and how we maybe re redraw some of the boundaries and try to avoid duplication of effort and all those sorts of issues. I've, I've been in conversation with colleagues at the National Library about just this and as you know <laughs> and um, I, I think again it goes back to my point of involving the creator but also practically looking at policy and going, well, is it within Ngātanga's policy to collect the proceedings of a conference such as this as a video record? That it would, f it would fall into, a, 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 if I was accessioning this myself, I'm not sure whether I would call it, it's not a published work necessarily, it's not edited, it's not, it's, it's not performance, it's what form is it and what genre is it? These are the questions I ask. And it, if, if the NDF is saying that the, the, the YouTube and video um, recordings of this conference are the true record of it, uh, as opposed to anything else written or published online, then um, that is a conversation that I think could be had with, um, with Nga Tanga Sound and Vision and possibly with the library as well. But we, we do bump up against the problem of YouTube, of how to collect from YouTube, and whether that's A, legal, B, can you get the best possible quality from it. Um, 
and and therefore maybe having conversations earlier in the piece with NDF or similar institutions to preempt that um, collection imperative. I love that you raised the question of whether or not uh, an, an unedited or very lightly edited um, video was a published work or not, uh, because we're having so many conversations about the distinction between what is published and unpublished internally within the library. So um, again, where those, those boundaries are shifting. Um, any comment from that side of the table on? Mm, um, so I think one of the problems we have, there's heap, heaps of stuff here. I think one of them is our, our own intellectualization of, of what things are, form and, and um, genre, I think is a barrier. I think we intellectually can imagine that the proceedings of a conference are a collectible entity. They are, they are the, 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 the units of informational distribution within the conference. We just struggle to put them in a clean box that we can then put on a shelf and forget about. Um, so I do wonder whether there's something we need to do about reevaluating what that means. Um, there's another one I wrote down, it's volume. So we may, we may, we ought to collaborate, we may want to collaborate, but in the end, I don't think the tools that we have scale sanely enough to mean that we, like the library, for example, could just give all of its moving video to a moving video entity and they would deal with it. I think we all have more work than we can deal with and I think that's actually a problem in and of itself. So until such times as we have efficient um, workflows and toolings, we are automating as much as we possibly can, which means that the humans are doing the gnarly edge cases and not the bulk of the work, I think we're gonna be stuck where we currently are. Um, and then finally on, on, on the YouTube thing, again, I think it's fascinating that we're still having this conversation. I think um, I would hope that by now, intellectually we we understand that there's a problem and that we've got we've got a direction of travel and i don't i i, I know that there is work happening in this space as a, as a professional as an, and an individual i i am painfully frustrated that this is still a conversation that we ought to, that we need to have are we legally allowed to collect from youtube i think youtube played its position to be a market dominant product and by that it kind of dominates the commons and I think for me there's an obligation that they play fair and they allow collecting institutions with a legal mandate to collect to deal with that so this is my personal view and it may or may not reflect the views of my employer. Um, <laughs> I, I wish that we weren't having this conversation because it's a solved problem we can collect from YouTube if we want to there are tools that do it for us they collect the content as best possible they collect the comments but we are, we are operating in a, in a very conservative risk averse model for understandable reasons, which means that we're actually, um, we're in praxis because of, of, of problems which we're, I don't know, I, I suspect we're kind of creating for ourselves a little bit. Um, and I wonder whether there's any movement that we might be able to get in, in, a, in, in a national platform that just says, you know what, we're just gonna get on with it because we're losing content. And, that, and that's kind of the bottom line. End rant, sorry. Well, we did have um, last week, Internet New Zealand had a public event as part of the uh, International Internet Preservation Consortium Conference, um, and they had Vint Cerf, father of, of the internet and grand poobah of Google somehow, um, who stated that these platforms have an obligation to um, enable archiving um, because of its importance to the evidentiary record. So uh, that's, that's a, a good one to have to, to point at. Um, moving from uh, a probably a, a reasonably well understood format at this point, um, well, that's a, a broad statement to make, but from, from these um, traditional uh, sound and um, moving image formats to emerging formats, uh, apps, virtual reality, augmented reality, um, and Tom's point right at the beginning in his introduction about the um, possibility of emerging new models for collaboration and even entirely new institutions. Um, and for me, working in legal deposit, where we say publishers have to give us a copy of their publication, like that's a simple thing, sometimes it's not. Um, sometimes they just don't have the ability or the right to give us the, the app or the platform that is required to run the publication. Um, and even if they do, that then gives us this huge diversity of, of software and platforms that we have to manage over time and sort of become a software shop. Um, so I guess with these emerging formats that are just so much more intricate coming out, um, how do we approach that as a sector?
Well, I, I mean, I, I don't think the tools we have are mature enough, Amy. You know, I, I really think we need to spend a lot more time digging around in what we've got, trying to, and, and I, I loved, loved your words from earlier, solve, them, solve some of those mysteries of the stuff which is 20 years old, and it will start to inform what practice looks like for dealing with this today. So we are really behind the curve. Apps are happening, and they're, and they're a thing, and I can't put my finger on any significant national collections that deal with that in a meaningful way. There are little bubbles of great things that we have managed to grab, but as a concept, they're still amorphous and, and there isn't a simple answer. And in the end, it's gonna come down to funding. You know, We need to have platform that allows us to emulate um, specific environments, to replicate specific databases, to have permission, to blah, blah, blah. You know, I mean, we, we know technically how to do it, but realistically, we're not funded, we're not, we're not we're not even anywhere close to that conversation right now. So I think time doing the, the stuff now to understand some of that conjecture around the intellectualization of objects helps us to inform some of those bigger questions. Um, if I can add to that as well, I think that um, it is, um, I really agree with what you say, Jay, about the idea that um, we may think that this is a recent issue with apps and um, like VR and AR and all the rest of it, but we, uh, we certainly have things in our collection that have been in our collections for some time that we haven't adequately managed or dealt with. So um, I'm working through a couple of examples at the moment where um, an item has been collected that has been considered as a purely physical object, but um, it has software that runs and it has you know it has a digital component that the curator who was part of the acquisition didn't consider as being important or maybe it was just too hard at the time and and so we've got things sitting in our collection stores that have um, time-based or digital elements that um, are an opportunity for us to work on and to enhance that object and make it useful in different ways. Um, and I don't say that as a criticism in any way. It's, it's obviously something that we're all grappling with um, and it's something that is going to cons um, increase over time. And I think the other thing that comes to mind for me is the um, uh, different to a legal deposit environment with a collection where items are considered um, individually by curators for acquisition. Um, part of it is that, that digital literacy of understanding what will this collection item be used for over time? How will it be um, researched, um, displayed, understood by people in the future? So I think um, it's one of those things that we need to um, all work together within institutions to increase our knowledge and expertise in this area. And I know there's um, a lot of records that I've come across in our published library catalogue from the mainly 90s and 2000s um, where there's a, a field like contains one computer disk, no more information <laughs> about what that might be. So we've got some surprises waiting for us in, in our vaults, I think. I'm not sure I have a comment. Well, actually, I mean, I think th this idea of, of possible new institutions is all well and good. And I think, you know, the, the, the history of one one of the collections that Ngata is down in Vision, which is the film archive, came out of that need in 1981. Jonathan Dennis said, who's collecting this film? No one. I'm going to do it. And he did. And And now we've inherited that collection. So... Of course, there's precedent for this, and I, I, th I would like to think that the kind of conversations we have today, and I take your point, Jay, about about intellectualization, and you know, maybe I was being more of a mouthpiece there, and I agree personally that you know the Library of Congress forms and genres list is perhaps in bad need of updating and also challenging. But um, the idea, also, I want to throw this out: is what is a work? where are the boundaries of the work and I'm thinking in particular one thing that I've been grappling with a multimedia publication called The Valley which is um, a website it's a traditional TV documentary it's a it's an AR um, a VR app um, it's a bunch of hypertext it's a bunch of uh, comments breakout videos uh, that kind of that is to me is a work it's called The Valley it's produced by Stuff Circuit and um, it's published and we need to collect it and at the moment we're not because it's those things are spread out and by necessity because it's a new form so i would hope that either we do have a new institution or a, 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 
an established cross collaboration between institutions that is tasked with setting out a pathway to, to go down. All right, we're going to have to leave it there. Um, I did like the, the, I think Fiona was getting at the notion of um, kind of the significant properties of a work emerging at the end there, so I would have liked to have touched on that, but we really don't have time. Um, so thank you very much to our panellists. Um, there is clearly no shortage of things to talk about. If anything of this sparks anything with you, then do come up and talk to us and let's get those collaborations going. And um, I'm sure Tom and I have more to <laughs> talk about after this. Um, to keep that particular cross-institutional collaboration going. Um, so thank you.